Yeah, so we talked about, last week we talked about the rewards, right? That we made it clear that the Bible, Jesus made it very clear that we can store up treasures in heaven, right? So let's go to Matthew 6 real quick. Let's, let's, let's recap a little bit. Matthew 6. So we understood from Matthew 6, 19 through 21, right, uh, from those passages that we as believers are not only commanded to uh, lay up treasures, we're commanded not to lay up treasures on earth, meaning we're commanded not to accumulate wealth, earthly treasures for our pleasure. Something wrong with having money, um, but we're not supposed to pursue those things to the point of pleasure, right? Um, so it says, don't lay up treasures on earth, right? But we are commanded to lay up treasures in heaven. Or in other words, we're commanded to accumulate heavenly wealth. So that's Matthew 6, verse 19 through 21. So this is the main passage here. So let's go and read. Let's go and read that real quick. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. It says, lay not up treasures upon earth. Meaning don't accumulate earthly wealth for your own pleasure. Okay? And he says here, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Essentially, he's talking about these things being temporary. And it can be taken from you. But then he says, lay up treasures for yourselves. There it is. Lay up treasures for yourself. In heaven, God wants you to have pleasure in heaven. And you will have pleasure in heaven, believe me. It's not going to be a sinful pleasure. It's going to be a pure pleasure. But God also wants us to lay up rewards. And we talked about that. There are rewards that God wants us to have, that he wants us to lay hold to. So he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt. And where thieves do not or cannot break through and steal, right? So that's essentially what we talked about last week, the commandment to lay up treasures in heaven and not to accumulate earthly wealth for our own pleasure. So let's look at, I want us to, um, I want to look at a little bit Go into a little deeper as to why we should not accumulate wealth on earth for our pleasure. Let's, I want y'all to go to the book of James real quick. And when I say accumulate wealth, we're talking about for your own pleasure. There, there's many rich people that, like Abraham was rich, Job was wealthy, uh, Boaz was wealthy. So we're not saying it's wrong for you to have a lot of money in your account. What we're saying is that it's wrong for you to accumulate those things for your own pleasure. That's what we're talking about, okay? So if someone has a lot of money, we're not, we're not condemning that. Even though Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, it's hard, it's not impossible. But the reason why it's hard is because, why? That man has everything that he, basically he has resources to, to, to get him out of anything, and he can trust in money rather than trusting in God, because the Bible says money answers all things. All things. Money answers all things. So things that God may want you to endure for a season, if you have money, a lot of times you can just pay your way out of it or get out of it in some way. But there are things that money cannot answer. Like having sickness in your body. Can't answer that. Can't answer a car wreck. You know, you lose one of your limbs or you end up killing somebody on accident because you're texting and driving or whatever, it doesn't answer that. You know, maybe you can pay off the judge, but in a lot of cases, you know, and this is also why we see a lot of celebrities get out of things, right? Or they, 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 they only pay a small penalty of what a normal person would pay because I don't have a lot of money, so I'm going to pay the price. Whatever the law says, I'm going to have to pay it. 
But if I was a millionaire and I was known, then I could do some crazy stuff and get away, and get away with a lot of crazy stuff. So, it doesn't make it right, but it does happen. Um, but let's go to James. Let's figure out what more Jesus is talking about before we get into this. James 5 real quick. Listen to this passage. I came across this passage yesterday, man. This is this is an eye opener for me. It says, "Go to James five, uh, chapter one, uh, chapter five, verse one, starting with verse one. It says, "Go to now, rich men, you rich men, and weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you." So right now, just from that verse, it looks like he's just talking about people that have money. He says, "Your riches are corrupted." Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. You know, one of the things that a lot of rich people have in their, in their closets is what? A lot of shoes and a lot of clothing. You never see them wearing the same thing twice, and God is addressing that. He says, you're rich, but you have miseries that are going to come upon you. You're rich, but all of the garments that you've made, that you lay up for yourself, they're moth-eaten, they're corrupted. Now let's go further into the context. Your gold and silver is cankered. That word cankered means rusted. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you. So now he's talking about the corruption or the rust of their money being a witness against them, essentially on the day of judgment. And it says, you shall eat your, it says, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. And then it says, you have heaped up treasure for the last day. So there he's talking about those that are heaping up these things. Okay? And then it says here, listen to what they do. He says, uh, Behold, the higher or the wages of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud. So what he's saying, he's saying, you've hired laborers, like Mike, you have laborers, Mary, you have laborers. If anybody has a business, you have a lake, and you hire people, you have laborers. Well, their hire is their wages. So he, this is, listen to what he's saying. He says, behold, the wages of your laborers who, who have reaped down your fields, meaning they did everything that you asked them to do, which is of you kept back by fraud. So he's talking about rich men who have laborers and are called to pay them a certain percentage of whatever, but he's keeping back their wages by deceit. So like for instance, if I, if I hire you to work for me and I, I agree to pay you uh, $10 an hour, and then when the end of the week comes and I say, well, you didn't do this, so I'm only gonna pay you eight. And that was never an agreement for us in the beginning. We never talked about that. Well, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about, I owe you this much, but I'm going to defraud you like Laban did Joseph. I'm going to defraud you. Laban, uh, Joseph said, listen, this man changed my wages ten times. He kept back wages that was due to him. You get what I'm saying? So if you have a business, beware, this isn't you. He says here, the higher of your laborers who have reaped your fields. And that wage, those wages are kept back by, from them by fraud. They cry out. So those laborers are crying out. So this is the context of what Jesus is talking about rich men. He's not saying Madison is wrong to have a bunch of money. He's saying Madison is wrong to heap up treasure for yourself. And then also there's a warning for those that are rich not to defraud their laborers. There's a temptation there. And he's making it very clear that that temptation is keeping money for yourself. You got all this money. I mean, listen, man, I remember I used to work for T-Mobile. I used to work for at and I worked for all of them. I worked for Sprint. Sprint wasn't that bad. But T-Mobile and at t they would constantly change the commission structure. I would work, sell a bunch of folds. I think I'll be supposed to be getting five grand this month. 
I get my check, it's 2500 I'm like, yo, where's my money? Oh, they changed the commission structure. Oh, they have to do... And that's what they were doing. They were keeping back the wages. That's what 99%, 90% of the jobs today in corporate world are not paying you what you really are supposed to be owed. Oh, we're going to pay you seven twenty-five. dollars Anybody can't nobody live off that. Can't nobody live off that. You guys are making, your, 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 your CEOs, your secretaries, everybody's driving nice cars. The people that are working in the stores, they got to keep them at a certain level. Do you know that normal society, unless you have your own business, if you work for some uh, a company in this in the corporate world or a restaurant or something that's well known, do you know that the structure of our pay is intended to keep you suppressed? Either you're working too much or you're not you're not making enough. So that you always have to rely. That's what Jesus is talking about. This is why he says you're heaping up treasures for the last days. Because in the last days God's going to judge. And he's going to judge the rich that do this. He says here. Because why? Because the laborers are crying out. How many of you have cried out about your job because of pain? Ever in your life? Like, man, they, they, they do that. And especially if you work a sales job. That's the, that's the, that's the worst. You think that you're getting this money and then you like, you get your check and it's like less. And then you ask them, you say, oh yeah, well, if you look at this column here, this column, and the, none, nobody talked about that at orientation. <laughs> nobody talked about that. But when it's time to pay, and then if you make the money, they may pay it to you, but then guess what they're going to do? If they see you making more money, they'll change the structure. That happened to me countless times. We used to hit numbers. Man, we used to hit, we used to sell so many phones. And then next thing you know, oh, next month we change the commission structure. Because they see you making a bunch of money. Like, come on. Come on. We're making more money for the company, but they don't want us to make that much money. It's crazy, man. So if you ever have a job, Muhammad, if you ever have your business, Jermaine, if you ever have a business, listen, J uh, Joseph, if you ever have a business, Al, if you ever have a business, don't do your workers like this. Because they will cry out. And then it says, the cries of those which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been Wanton, meaning you are found lacking. No one wants to hear that when they stand before God, that you are lacking. I'm reminded of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son, the writing on the wall, and it wrote out, tickle, tickle, something, something. <laughs> tickle, telly, telly, tickle. And I was scared of him. I would have been scared. And then Daniel came and was like, yo, you're found lacking. You're going to be destroyed. Because you knew better. You saw all the things that your father went through for the Lord. And he turned his life to the Lord. You still want to do evil? Yeah, the Lord then wrote out your judgment right on the wall. That's it. And that night, that guy perished. That night. It says, you have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. What that means is you fattened your heart. Think about this for a second. When you are living luxuriously, when you're living luxuriously, do you know that you are fattening yourself for greater judgment? Think about it like this. If I have cattle and Joseph and Alice come over to my house and I got Mary's like, hey, go slay the, the fattest calf out there. I'm not going to go get the lean one, the one that don't got no meat. We got guests. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get the one that we've been feeding well to feed these guests. So that's what happens to the wicked. They've made themselves fat for judgment, only to be slaughtered. When you're living luxuriously, you're making yourself fat, spiritually. And that means a greater judgment. That makes sense, guys? Now, I want to tap on this real quick. The word rusted. Go back to verse... Uh, uh, your gold, and your, verse 3. Your gold and your silver is rusted. 
That's cankered means rusted. And then it says, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. So Jesus isn't talking about natural rust. Okay? When I looked up the word rust in the Greek, you know what that word came back in? You know what an asp is? It's a snake. Okay, now, it's also another definition. That's definition number one, but then definition, that's definition A, and then definition B is this. Spoken of men, Given to reveling. That word reveling means this abusive, insulting, criticism. Criticism. And culminating I'm going to explain all this to you. So, that word rusted, it means the first definition was poison of serpents. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, you brood of what? Why? Because they were people who had abusive and insulting criticism. They were people that by their abusive and insulting criticism injured others. So when you speak evil of people, and it, like, Think about this for a second. Like, there's nothing wrong particularly to call out false teachers. But some people are very abusive and insulting. That's called reveling. Do you know that that word is in Galatians and is listed as a work of the flesh? And it says, those that practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So, like, when people are calling out even false teachers, which is nothing wrong with that, when you're doing it in a godly manner, but there's a lot of people who are very insulting with their criticism. They're trying to tear you down. They're trying to defame people. They're trying to injure them. So, those, when in the context of the rich man, he's talking about people, rich men, who use their tongues to deceive their laborers in order to defraud them. That's it. And they injure them. Injure them meaning that they hurt them. Not physically, but emotionally. Like church hurt. That's injury to the soul. Injury to, that's what it is. Injury is, in this kind is injury to the soul. That is done by someone's words or through someone's deception. Make sense? So that's what he's talking about. So it's two things that we need to be mindful of when it comes to money. Do not lay up treasures in, on earth for your own pleasure. And do not gain riches through deception. By being dishonest. Or by, you know, there are people even in corporate world. They will defame you, insult you, and criticize you in front of people that are in uh, positions of power 
in order to gain an advantage over you that you stay where you're at in your cubicle and they will be promoted. That's what Jesus is talking about. So he calls it the poison of asps. Make sure you don't have any poison in your mouth against people that and to injure them. Don't be like what Jesus said or what he's saying here. So I just wanted to give you guys that because I learned that because that poison of asp is like everywhere in the Old Testament. Now I understand what it means. It's talking about these types of words, abusive and solid criticism. And injuring people by those things and deceit and dishonesty with your tongue. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Perfect. So we don't want that to be anyone because that's the work of the flesh. And we don't want you to miss out on where God is taking his people. Okay, so. So circling back to the treasures, okay. Circling back to the treasures. We understand that, uh, we understood that through scripture, uh, the treasures God has called us to lay up are actually what? Rewards, right? Rewards for the labor that we do here on earth for God. So we understand that salvation is a free gift. You didn't work for that. You can't work for that. You can't earn it. But the works that accompany our faith what does it prove? Our faithfulness. So salvation's free, but the works that we're called to do prove our faithfulness and renders us reward in heaven that will be paid out to us at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know I'm mostly talking about the rewards in heaven because I don't think that there's much teaching on that, but understand that there are rewards in this life too. So I, I want you guys to know that as well. There are rewards in this life, but I want to focus on the ones in heaven because I want you to set your eyes on things above and not on things beneath. So let's go to James real quick. James 2, 14 to 20. And this is kind of a subject that many people have a problem with. They don't understand it. Some don't understand it. Some do understand it, but they don't want to receive it. And let's go to verse, y'all in James. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 14. So let's listen here. What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? That's a question. If your faith doesn't have works, can your faith save you? Most will say, yeah. But what is he saying? Can faith without works save you? Yes. I gave my life to Jesus. Yes. Because of what he has done and not anything of myself. True. I'm saying. But. What about the life that has to live? What about the faithfulness? If I cannot believe in Jesus and have faith and then show no faithfulness in my works, in my lifestyle, and still expect to be saved by that faith? No. <laughs> no. So he says here. Can faith save him? If a brother, listen to what he says, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? So what does it profit for you to say to someone in here that needs something and you have it, to say, oh, you will give me straight. You just have faith. When you have something that you can give, he says, that's not what the type of faith that God is looking for. He says here, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead. What, what thing that is dead, what is it that's dead that can save? 
Nothing. So if your faith is dead, which knowing that it can only be alive by our actions, how can it save you? Yea, if a man say, you have faith and I have works. He says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So James is basically saying, this I, this I believe God is going to look at our faith. He's going to look at it by our works on the day of judgment. That's why when we read the parable, and Jesus was like, what did you do with my stuff? And the two guys were like, yeah, I flipped it, I got more. And the other guy was like, I buried it, I didn't do anything. Did his faith save him? Weeping and gnashing the teeth was where he went. So it says, I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe in truth. The devils don't do work, they believe that their faith ain't saving them. So how can it save us? But will you know, O oh vain man, vain means unprofitable, that faith without works is dead. You can keep on reading that in your own time, but it talks about Abraham and how he was justified by his works. Because God told Abraham, listen, go to a land that I'm going to show you. Whatever Abraham said, man, I believe God. I believe God just spoke to me. And he stayed in his father's house. That's disobedience. You think God going to say, oh, well, you got faith. So, you know, you don't have to do what I asked you to do. It doesn't make any sense. God told me and my wife to move to Atlanta. I'm like, y'all always spoke to us. Oh, yeah, Amen. And we still in Florida. For what? Why are we still there? We got to put our faith into action. So although I'm justified when I believe God, my works must follow what God said in order to prove my faithfulness. Right? All right. So, another thing we talked about last week was God being a rewarder. Does anybody remember what the, the word rewarder means? That was like one of the most important parts. Does anybody remember what rewarder meant? No? All right. This is why we're going to go over this stuff. Just to refresh. So when it says in Hebrews 11 that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That's what that word rewarder means in the Greek. It means one who pays wages. And what did we say about, what did we say the name was of a person who pays wages? An employer. Okay, and then who's the one that actually is receiving the wages? That's it. That's it. So, this is how we know that God rewards us for our works. This is one aspect of it. And then to give you guys at least the first three ones that we talked about yes, uh, last week, you can write this down, Matthew 6, 1 through 4. God rewards or he pays wage, wages to those that do alms in secret. Matthew 6, 5, and 6, he pays wages to those that pray in secret. Matthew 6, 18, and 19, he pays wages to those who fast in secret. That's not, uh, that's literal. God is literally going to repay you for the things that you do on this life according to his will. And then we talked about 
You guys remember we talked about the, uh, the parable of the owner and the laborers? Let's go there real quick, and then we're going to go to the last section of it. Let's go to uh, Luke 19 real quick. Here he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a far country. Who do we say that that was? It's Jesus. The far country was here on earth to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered to them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy till I come. Actually, this is not the one. Let me see. Uh, we can read this one. We can read this one. That's fine. He called ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy till I come. That word occupy means to do business. Remember we talked about that? And then he says, But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. So we didn't read this one, but this is just another parable. He gave them of his goods. Remember? That was the 10 pounds, even though it's a different parable. But then, then he left and went back to where he's from. And, but he commanded them to occupy till he comes, till he comes back. But it says those that he gave the money to, they hated him. Remember that one servant we talked about last week? That was him. He hated him and he sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he commanded these servants to be called to him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained. So God gives us goods. He gives us spiritual riches. God has given us spiritual riches. What did we say those spiritual riches were? Does anybody remember? Spiritual riches is the wealth that God has given you. Your calling. Your, uh, your calling. Your gifts. Your knowledge, your wisdom, your understanding. This is your spiritual wealth. Every gift and calling that God has given you, has imparted unto you, he is looking for what? He's looking for a return. This is what we use our works for. To return to God and increase on what he has given What's the increase look like? Sometimes it looks like people. You minister to people and people are coming to the faith and they're being discipled. Sometimes it looks like increase in your own life when you're uh, growing in the things of God. Sometimes it looks like, uh, you know, sometimes you don't even see it. But whatever you sow in this life, the righteousness that you sow, understand whatever seed you plant, it will produce. So you may not, like Abraham, he doesn't even see the fullness of his obedience. We're part of Abraham's seed through Christ. God says, I'm going to give you as many children as you can see. You see the stars? You see the sand? Yeah, you're going to have more children than that. But Abraham didn't die. Abraham died not seeing that. Who's the children? All of those that have come to faith in Jesus. So whenever we meet in the air with Jesus and the sky is filled, filled with the church, Filled with all who have ever lived the last 7,000 years. That has ever lived, who trusted in Christ, Abraham is going to see his seed. He's going to see the reward of his obedience. God's like, yeah, look at all these. This is what, because you, I said, you go to a land that I'll show you. He waited. Man, Abraham waited six, five thousand, five and a half thousand years to see. 
Talk about waiting. 5,000 something years. And we'd be complaining you know, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, some years. It's a long time, but Abraham's like, I'm, I'm still waiting to see everybody. So he says here, he wanted to know how much every man gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, the pound that you gained, that you gave me, I gained ten. And he said to him, Well, good, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because you have been faithful in very little, I will give you authority over what? Man. That's literal. That's literal. Jesus is going to reign on this earth for 1,000 years. You think he's going to reign in a place where it's just desert? Jesus is going to build new cities. And then he's going to give authority over those cities to his people. And the second came saying, Lord, thy pound has gained five. And he said, likewise, be thou over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is my pound, which I've kept and laid in a napkin. <laughs> what? A napkin? What does that mean? It says handkerchief. I got to figure out what that means. So it's kind of a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. You take up what you lay not down, you reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of thy own mouth will I judge thee, you wicked servant. Remember he called him slothful in the other one. You knew that I was an austere man, taking that which I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow. Wherefore, why didn't you give my money to the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with interest? Look. Whatever you have, whatever God has given you, he's looking for an increase. If you have your own business, or if you work for somebody, do you know that those people are looking for you to do what you ask them to do? And if you don't do what they ask you to do, what are they going to do? They're going to let you go. Well, how much more of God? God's not going to be like, oh, brother, it's okay. You put it in a napkin. Here, use this whack napkin to wipe your tears. No! He's going to say you're wicked and you're slothful because you didn't do what I asked you to do with my goods. That's why Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. So if you have a lot of gifts, there's more requirement for you. But understand that this you don't have to go around looking around trying to figure out, oh, I'm going to increase this. No, just stay faithful to the Lord. Stay faithful to the scriptures. Stay faithful in the season that you're in or whatever season that may be to the Lord. And God will make sure that you have, that you will bear fruit. Because one man's plants, another waters, but God gives an increase. It's God's job. But God's not increasing people who are slothful. He will increase the diligent. And who wouldn't want authority over 10 cities? And that's just a little bit. So that is essentially what we talked about last week. And I got a verse here for you guys. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So you were born again for what? Good works. To do good in the earth. That's what you were created for. That's what I was created for in Christ. I was born again, not just to, to pray and, 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 and to do religious things, to do good. The Bible says Jesus went about all Galilee, Jerusalem, doing good. Casting out devils in the sick and doing good. And the Bible says that all the things that Jesus has done when he was on earth, if it were written out, there would be no book that could contain it. That's how much good he did. But you got to remember, Jesus also had been given much. Jesus was an apostle. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was an evangelist. Jesus was a teacher. Jesus was a pastor. He had a gift of healing. He had prophecy. He could speak in tongues. Jesus could do all these things. He had every single gift and every single calling. Of course, he would have to do 
more. More we required of him. But again, it wasn't by strain or striving. He just was obedient when the time presented itself to do good. You know, there's many opportunities that we pass up. We go to the store every day. We go to work every day. The Holy Spirit be speaking to us and talk to this person or bring up me or, you know, and we just kind of like, you know, like these are opportunities that God is putting before us to do what? To do good and to gain reward. So now, the last thing we're going to talk about is how do we lay up treasure in heaven? This is the fun part. I'm going to erase this here. Everybody, everybody do that? Everybody do that? How do we lay up treasure? All right. You guys ready? Here's how you get your reward. Number one, working for God. We know this. Working for God. I'll give you the scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 and 9. There's many scriptures, guys. I mean, it's all over the Bible. But this is the one I'm going to give. Working for God or doing his will. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. He that planted and he that waters are one. Okay? And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So he that plants and he that water are, are they're the same. They're the same. They're one. They work together. And every man shall receive his own reward, there it is, according to his own labor. So you're rewarded for your labor. For we are laborers together with God, meaning God is laboring with us, we're laboring with him. You are God's husbandry, you are God's building. So essentially he's telling you, when Jesus talks about the vine and the branches and, you know, the vineyard and all this stuff, like you're the vineyard. So when you're laboring, where are you laboring? You're laboring within the church, within the body of Christ. We're not talking about a building, even though that's where we meet. We're talking about within the hearts and souls of men. That's what God's called you to plant and water. And then you also labor as an evangelist. The Bible says, do the work of an evangelist. So that's number one. I'm not going to spend too much time on each one because i got a few to go over. But working for God, meaning doing his will according to your calling. What's your calling? What's your gift that God has given you? We can't sit on these things anymore. We can't put our talents in a napkin anymore. We can't bury our talents in the earth. Because when Jesus comes back, guess what? He's looking for that return. He wants to see what you did for him. So it's time to find these things. Number two, working for God willingly, willingly, that's number two. So God doesn't just want you to do, he wants you to do it with a cheerful heart, cheerful heart, willingly. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, and 17. Okay? This is what it says. For though I preach the gospel, listen to what Paul says. For although I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Meaning there's nothing for me to boast about. For necessity is laid upon me. Meaning, I have to do this. It's, it's necessary for me to do this. He says, 
Yea, woe unto me. Woe is a bad thing. If I preach not the gospel. He says, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. So not just working for God, you got to be willing to do it. It shouldn't be a burden. It shouldn't be stressful. Although anything can carry its measure of stress, we shouldn't do it grudgingly. There's no reward for those people. God is looking at the hearts of men. He's looking at our intents. So working for God and working for him willingly renders a reward. And then I have Colossians 3, 23 and 24 here. Listen to what the scripture says. I write that one down too. Listen to this. For whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of your inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. So he says, whatever you do for God, do it willingly. Do it heartily. You are being rewarded for your willingness. Man, I ain't never met an employer who said, well, at least you were willing. I mean, maybe there are good ones out there, right? But most of them, man, they don't care if you're willing. You better do it the right way. They don't care about how willing you do it, willing or not willing. You just better do it. Jesus like, man, I'll pay you for being willing to do it. That's a good boss. It's the best boss. He says, you'll receive the reward of your inheritance. Number three. Being persecuted for righteousness. Do you know that God's going to reward you for the things that you go through because you're doing his will? Your suffering will be rewarded. Your tribulation will be rewarded. Listen to what he says in Matthew 5, 11. Matthew 5, 11 to 12. He says, Blessed are you when men revel you. Remember that word revel? What did we say it was? Earlier. Reveling. Insults. Huh? Insults. Insults. He says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they, they, they persecuted the prophets which were before you. So, what is Jesus going to do? He's going to reward us for our persecution. He's going to reward you for the people that said things bad about you. That kept you from moving and advancing in certain things. He's going to do that. He's going to do that. So you don't have to be. Jesus said. Make sure he said it for us. Yeah. He said rejoice. Be glad. Why? Because you're going to be repaid for the things that you go through in this life for his sake. Now, we're not talking about tribulation and persecution that you're going through because you did something that you shouldn't do. Right? You're going to have to discover that and get through it. But the things that you go through because of the 
evil in the world that is against you, even the martyrdom that has happened and that's going to happen and that is happening now, all of that is going to be rewarded. You're going to have a lot of rewards, folks, if you endure it. You're going to have a lot of rewards. So that what do we have there? Matthew 5, 11 to 12. That, that's what that was. All right.
For you have rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded you evil. You have showed me this day how you have dealt with me. For as much as when the Lord had delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go? Wherefore the Lord reward you for the good that you have done to me this day. He says, if a man finds his enemy, if his enemy is in his hands, will you have the opportunity to, 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 to diss that person that was talking about you or to make them lose their job or do anything that, whatever. If you have the opportunity to do that, would you do it? Well, David didn't do that. This man was trying to kill him. And David could have killed him right then while he was relieving himself. He was stuck. He didn't. And Saul says, listen, you've done good to me when I was doing evil to you. You're righteous to me. And may the Lord reward you for the good that you've done to him. The Lord is going to reward David for that. For not touching King Saul when he could have. Even though he was his enemy, he chose to spare his life. Listen, that's a picture of the cross. That's a picture of our relationship with God. God is so much bigger than us. And we're so small, we're like ants. Like, we're in his hand. We boast against God. We say all these evil things against God when we're in the world. And people do that now. And God hears all of it. And he just blesses them. He could just be like, oh, cockroach, gone. Just another cockroach, gone. Or kick over the ant pile. And all the ants run. And spray them all with holy wrath. <laughs> they can be gone. But he doesn't do that. Did you just? He doesn't do that. He chose to do what? Love his enemies. How do you treat your enemies? Do you bless them? God blessed us. God has done good to us when we haven't done good to him, even as Christians. So how much more should we show mercy? You're going to be rewarded for loving your enemies. Number five. I don't want to go with that one here. Let's do this one. Forsaking family and Earthly things for God. Now, let's put this in context. Because there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people <laughs> who abuse, misuse, mistreat their families. I'm doing the will of God. And you really not. God told me to do this. And God didn't really speak to you. You're just being rude. Okay? This is what Jesus said. I'm going to give you the context behind it because I don't want anyone to leave here with the wrong impression. Matthew 29, 19, 29. This is what Jesus said. And everyone that has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake or because of me shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Ooh. Houses, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, because of me, you'll receive a hundred times more. So think about this for a second. The disciples, there's 12 of them, right? All right. So we know two of them are brothers. A couple of them are brothers. I think it was the sons of thunder. And we have Peter. Peter is married. We know this from the scripture that Peter was married. Think about this. Jesus comes on the scene. And he tells Peter to follow him. Do you think Peter followed Jesus, right? He, do you know what, that he actually like lived with Jesus for three years? 
You know that Peter had a family? <laughs> Sons of Thunder. They're fishing with their father. The Bible makes it very clear. Jesus says, follow me, and I'll make you fish with men. They forsook their nets and the father that they were fishing with. That's what he's talking about. Does it make sense? So he's not saying you just go out here and you're just doing things for God, random things, and you're just like, I just got to serve God. I mean, I know, man, I know people that think they're serving God, and they're not. But because they're just doing random things for God, but it's really for themselves, and they're leaving their family and everyone behind, it's a mess. But when God calls you to do something specific, like when me and my wife left, Atlanta, like we had to forsake what was there. We had to forsake the, the place that we lived in. We forsook the job. There are times when God called me to street preach and I have to forsake my family and go. There are times that I can stay. But there are times when the impression on me is like, I need to go. And it's like, hey, I gotta go. All right, cool, go. Go street preach or whatever. Like there are many a time with Joseph, God might say, Joseph, I need you to go. And you got to talk to your wife. Your wife come to the agreement like, yeah, this is what the Lord said. All right, go do it. I'm going to support you. Or vice versa. Or you two. Or you. Or you. Like, there are like these people, these disciples forsook Abraham. He left his whole native land, his father's house. Like, this is what Jesus is talking about. Left it. So sacrifice. God reward sacrifice. When you forsake what, because uh, it says houses and things, so earthly things and brethren and sisters, all the mother, all these things, when you know that's what you're supposed to do, and you know it's going to be a turning away, we're not talking about like, oh yeah, I'm doing the Lord's work. No, we're talking about, hey, I got to go for a little bit. The Lord's called me. We need to pray about this. You know, when my wife uh, heard that we need to move to Atlanta, she, she didn't, I don't, I don't know if she didn't believe me or she just was unsure. But she, she made it known to me like within the last year, like, you know, I didn't, I didn't like believe you or something like that. But she prayed and God eventually told her. So God isn't like here trying to divide your house up and make your house in ruins. Like if you guys are on one accord, then guess what? Your wife or your husband's going to pray like, hey, let's seek God together. You know, you may have to go back to Africa for a second. You was here without your family for a time. So you know how to, to, to forsake for a season. Well, there may become a time when you have to do that for God. And it's just the same situation. You guys are still married, you still love each other, but you just may have to go. Or you may be go together. Whatever. You never know. <laughs> same with you, same with every one of us. So when you forsake what you know, when you, when you forsake things of this earth for the things of God, there's a reward. You know who's another prime example? I saw this last night. Ruth. Ruth. Ruth was a woman, huh? Yeah. So there was a woman named Naomi. She had a husband and two sons, I think. She went to Moab because there was a famine. And her son, one of her sons married Ruth. And then her husband and her two sons ended up dying, uh, Naomi. And the only person that was left with her was Ruth. And Naomi was like, listen, I'm going back to Israel. And Ruth's like, okay, I'm going to go with you. And Naomi's like, listen, I don't have anything to offer you. It's not like I can have children. And if I do have children, you have to wait for them to get older if you're going to marry him. He's like, listen, I'm going to go wherever you go. Your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. Boom, she went. So she meets a man named Boaz. Rich man. He's a picture of God. He's a redeemer. In the Old Testament, those that had family to carry on a nation, to carry on a people where there was no son or no father, in order to carry on that, that lineage, you can marry within the closest relative. Well, there was a person that was closest relative that didn't actually want to do it, so Boaz was up next. So Boaz was like, 
Okay, I'm married to Ruth and that, and we, we know that from Ruth came Obed and Jesse and the King David. So she was like grafted into the family of Christ. Such a blessing. But, but we see here in Ruth chapter 11, to chapter 2, listen to what Boaz said. After he found out that Ruth had forsaken her family and her land to follow the Lord, he says, uh, Boaz said to her, it has been fully shown to me all that you have done to my to thy mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and mother in the land of your nativity, and have come to a people that you did not know. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given to you of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you come to trust. So she forsook it, and she forsook it for someone that had nothing to offer her. She just loved Ruth. She just loved Ruth. I'm sorry. She loved Naomi. And she was like, listen, I forsake my land. I forsake, uh, my husband already died. Man, I'm just going to follow this woman. I'm going to be with her. I'm going to care for her. And ends up being drafted into the family line of, of, of Jesus Christ. So the Lord repay your work. And a full reward be given to you of the Lord. Under whose wings you have come to trust. So forsaking family and earthly things for God renders a reward. I'm going to stop right there. I got like four more, but I got like four more. How long have I been on? So does anybody have any questions about that? So, in regards to our next season, you know, we're here in this new spot. I want everyone to understand that there's work to do. You know, we're not just here for one another, to look at one another every Sunday. We have to do the work of God. We have to do the work of evangelism. Whether that be together, which we will do many things together, but also on your own time. God's going to repay you in his five ways that you know you can be sure that God's going to repay you for the work that you have done for him. He's going to work for him. He's going to repay you. You do his will willingly. He's going to pay you. You persecute for righteousness sake. He's going to pay you. Love your enemies. He's going to pay you. Forsake family and earthly things for, this, for, for, for God and his will. It's going to pay you. There's always a reward. There's always a reward. I guess I'll name this one. Being faithful through hardships. That's another thing that God rewards us for. You can read about that in Hebrews 12. Being faithful through hardships. So, no questions?